of their event. But before we kick off, just make sure that everybody can see the, the screen. Fabulous. Well, today we're go, uh, going to go for a different direction. Usually we'll go for a fiction writer. We had Denise Mina before. This time we're going for a slightly different direction in writing. And it will be themed around art and photography. And I just want to welcome Laura Gonzalez. Thank you for having me. Anybody here don't write fiction? You all write fiction. You don't write fiction. Don't write. <laughs> Wonderful. You read. Yes. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about writing about art and also writing as art. So a type of writing where you don't necessarily read it in books. What is it that you do with you can do other things with writing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do with writing. That's not necessarily reading it on the page. It's a bit left field. Um, what I do is mainly I'm a dancer. I teach at the art school. Um, and I'm mainly a contemporary dancer, but multidisciplinary. I dance and I sing, I draw, I write, I recite poetry, all in the same space. So I write while I dance, I sing while I draw. It's a bit crazy, <laughs> but really wonderful. Um, I teach at the art school. I teach visual arts at the art school. But my background is very interdisciplinary. I don't like to settle. I don't like to say I'm one thing. So normally I define myself as an artist, but I think writers are artists. So it incorporates that, if you see what I mean. So I studied painting in Spain, but when I was in my painting course, I decided to do sculpture. And then I moved to sculpture, and I decided to paint. Um, and then I did a master's in drawing, but I decided to do sound. And then I was supposed to do sculpture for my PhD, but I ended up doing photography. So you see, I'm a bit of a rebel. I really don't like to do as I'm told, and I think that comes about in my writing quite a bit. Um, I perform. This is a picture of a performance we did at Tramway last year for the Commonwealth. Um, so mainly I, I work a lot with Tramway and, and theatres like that. I have performed at the Theatre Royal, which probably was the best day of my life, I have to say. It was what a beautiful theatre. And if you think the theatre itself is beautiful, if you ever get the chance to see the backstage, it's really wonderful. It's like a proper theatre, you know, like you see on telly. It's, it's really fun. Um, I work with text a lot, so a lot of the inspiration for the movement I do comes from poetry. And I'm part of this um, group that is multidisciplinary, that has a visual artist, a sound artist, a writer and translator and two dancers, and we all work together to try to make something that has something from all of us. So we have done a few performances that start with a poem and a painting. And the poem is a poem by a Algerian poet called Mohammed Dib, which Madeleine, who's the translator, translated from Arabic to French, from French to English. Translating poetry is just something that is so incredibly complicated. Imagine from Arabic to English. Um, so we work very much on, on this poem. It's called um, Hagar Awakens. And I'll tell you a little bit about Hagar. You might know who Hagar is. And this comes also from a painting that the Hunterian Gallery here in Glasgow bought by John Runciman, a very old painting, 1700s. And it's a tiny little thing, something like this. And it depicts the story of the biblical story of Hagar, who was vanished into the desert by her husband because she couldn't bear children. And when she's in the desert, an angel appears and says, you have to go back. So Hagar Awakens is the visitation of the angel. And this painting is called Hagar and the Angel. You can't see very much in here, but what really uh, interested us as visual artists in this painting was the fact that um, Hagar is supposed to be going into the desert. But if you look at the painting, this desert looks a lot more like a Scottish glen to me. <laughs> 
than the desert. It's not the desert as I know it. So we work a lot with the idea of landscape and writing about landscape and how can you write the desert in Scotland, for example. Um, so we make really strange performances with sculptures and dust sheets and um, fabric. We work a lot with fabric and we have a lot of fun. By the way, all of this is improvised. We don't have any choreography. We don't choreograph, we just improvise. And we take a lot of photographs and pictures. Uh, we normally have project. This is why I've got this projector, because we dance with the projector, projected images. So these are some images that we make. And part of this, I have a writing practice. And um, I write <coughs> probably in a very different way than you do. And the way I write my, will seem a little bit strange to you, I think. Because I write with someone. But it doesn't mean that we co-write together. <coughs> so that doesn't mean that we sit together, we both write the same thing. I write with this woman called Eleanor. She lives in London, she's also a visual artist. And we have written, published writing in this way. So Eleanor would write to me 300 words, but only let me see the last sentence. And then I have to write 300 words, and then I let her see only the last sentence. It's like a game that we play with each other. A game of trusting each other to see how we go. And there used to be this drawing game um, in the 1920s called Exquisite Corpse. I don't know if you've heard of it, where the purpose is to write, to uh, draw a whole person, and you get a paper and you fold it. Yeah, you know the one, and you draw the head. Well, that's what we do with writing. That's exactly how we write which is a bit crazy, isn't it? But you know it works. And in 2013, we published this book called Madness, uh, Madness Women and the Power of Art. Oh. All this improvising. Stay. Okay. So Madness <coughs> Women and the Power of Art. Um, this is an edited collection which I edited. I write books but I also edit other people's writing and this is a collection of ten, 10 writers and Eleanor and I wrote the last chapter in the form I'm telling you. Um, it was a super experience to work with her and I'm working with her on a book on motherhood at the moment. Um, we're writing both about our mothers and about both not having children, at least at the moment. Um, and it's, and it's a very interesting way of um, trusting writing and trusting words and getting inspiration from just one line. You have to get so much meaning in that line to develop. I write mainly, I don't write fiction, but I don't write non-fiction either. I write a type of writing called theoretical fiction, which is odd. Um, it's kind of academic writing, so you have your references, you read a lot when you write, and you write about other people's works, but there are characters in it. So normally when Eleanor and I write, um, it's not us. We invent characters. And this book is about the character of a hysteric woman in the 19th century. A woman who has lost her voice, that can't speak, therefore writes. And we both kind of wrote about this character. Sometimes I get the character of the doctor in there, because uh, Eleanor and I have this dialogue, and sometimes one is patient, one is doctor. And we have this kind of conversation. Um, the writing we do is very much published in books, or in, or in journals, or things like that, or in collected essays. But we also perform our writing. We stage it. We go on stage. And we think about um, dramaturgy, we think of lighting, we think of costume, we think of images, and how our writing relates to images. What happens when you read and you have an image behind you? Sometimes that image is text, sometimes we're reading something and there is text behind us, and then the person who's seen doesn't know which way to look, but that's very much what we do and why we do it. Um, and we sing as well. This is a picture of us singing. <laughs> we do sing as well. well uh, shout. Not very good singing, to be honest with you. But we do like it. 
So this is this is the book. Um, I I really like the idea of performing reading, and I know some of you in the writers group would do that. I mean, you come in here and you read, right? I've I've, I've heard that that you come in and, and read your own writing, um, and I'm really interested in this idea of reading writing. So. For the bank holiday weekend, I did a performance on this um, in the Lauriston Arches, just behind the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow. Um, I read for nine hours, for three days, in a very cold and damp space. <laughs> in this space, <laughs> some railway arches. Um, and I would read Freud's first case history. I really like the writing of Freud. He's one of my favorite writers. I really like that kind of medical writing. I find he's very clear, and there is a clarity in that. And he was talking about something that you cannot see, about the mind, right? About what we feel, how we feel, why we feel this way. And he was writing about something very complicated with clarity, and that really always amazes me, because I'm really interested in very complicated things that you cannot touch very easily, like madness, or hysteria, or what speechlessness, or things like that. So I read for nine hours Freud's first case history, but when somebody would sit opposite me, I would close the book and tell them from memory the story I read, trying to remember it. By the end of the, what is it, 27 hours of reading, I could remember a lot of it. It was really interesting. I could remember rather a lot of it. And it was an exercise in memory. It was an exercise, you know the story, when you read a really good novel and somebody tells you, oh, what is it about? Um, I've got this joke with my mum, because if my mum and I see the same film and then she tells me what she's seen, it's always something completely different from what I've seen. It's like, really? I didn't remember that. So I was working on that idea. When you're reading, what is it that you remember? What is it that you tell somebody about this book? So the first person who sat, I saw 300 people, by the way, about 300 people. So by the end of it, I could really tell the story. The first person got two sentences. <laughs> by the end of it, they got all the details, all the details about what was happening, uh, which was huge fun to do. I still have frostbite, by the way. Uh, the weekend weather wasn't very good. No. One of my first published pieces is in this book, Managing Creativity, Exploring the Paradox, which is an academic book published by Cambridge University. Um, and I only have a chapter in it. Um, but is there, I, I'm, I'm really happy with this chapter. It's really interesting because I chose to write about this. Now, I'll give somebody a gold star if you tell me what this is. You are amazing, guys. Usually my students are like, it's a spaceship, it's a sculpture. I can't remember who is by. Yes, by Philip Stark. So that's what I wrote about. I wrote about what this is. How do you write about something like this? How do you write, Pasap? What is that right? It wrote 9,000 words. It's rather a lot, isn't it? It's, it is rather a lot, isn't it? Well, how I wrote about it is by not forgetting about the object. So a lot of the writing I do, because I am a dancer, and because I'm a visual artist, is what's called experiential writing. And this is something that I, how I write about art. I never forget about what I'm writing about. So it's not that, oh, I'm going to write about that lemon squeezer, I start with my computer and off we go. No. I wrote with it here, touching, looking at it, playing with it, squeezing lemons with it, giving it to people, making noise with it, just making sure that it was with me all the time and that I would understand what this object was. And that's how 9,000 words came. I also became an expert in lemon squeezers, so I didn't only, yeah? I'll tell you there are six types. If you read my book, you'll know there are six types of lemon squeezers that squeeze in different ways. It's very interesting research. So I began collecting these lemon squeezers and seeing how they operate, you know, what, you know doing little experiments with them. And um, one of the things that I say in the book is that 
this thing is a bestseller. That's why you know about it, probably, because a lot of people have some of this. This sells very well. They even have key rings. I mean, you know, it's quite something, isn't it? Um, but it doesn't work very well. <laughs> no, it's not a very good lemon squeezer. No. Oh, well, no, 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 well, no. You want to put all the lemon juice goes. You know, you need to have a bowl underneath to collect it. Yes. You normally put the glass underneath, which you need to have the right glass. Not any glass will fit in here. It's the right glass that you need in here. And you usually um, squeeze lemons. More of it stays in here than in your glass, by the way. And look, try to squeeze lemons with a tripod. Yeah. All right? A nightmare, if you ask me. <laughs> um, you see, this is my, my, I, I bought it. You see, it has never been used. <laughs> because it's also one thing I found, I found two things about this, um, by using one of a friend's, you not know, mine, is it's very difficult to clean. I don't like anything that's very difficult to clean. And um, the acid from the lemon corrodes the aluminium. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So can you can you have a worse design thing oh. ever? <coughs> but do you know what I'm saying? People buy it is just because it's something they can look at it as a sculpture and they can take it in their work and I'm in with the end crowd just a status symbol really. Of course. That's what I wrote about. <laughs> I wrote about why people buy this thing. Why is it? So um, it was a really interesting process and one that helped me a lot to think about how to write about art and about how when you write about art you should never lose the art. It's not an intellectual process, it's a process of experience. What is it that you see when you look at a painting? What, what are you seeing? Never forget that. So I never write historically, I never read a lot of things about it beforehand. I just sit with the thing I'm writing about and say, okay, what's happening here? Do I like it? If I like it, why I like it? If I don't like it, why I don't like it? and trust your own experience of that. Because usually if you ask the right questions, there is, there is a way of writing about it, and it will be interesting to somebody else. So for us, looking at the painting of John Runciman, Hagar and the Angel, the idea that what we saw was not a desert was a really interesting process to, to create writing. Why is it not a desert? And what, you know, what kind of references or similarities can you make in between Scotland and the desert. And if you're a bit smart with words, you've got a poem right there, just by that little topic. You know, and, and Madeleine did write poems about Hagar, and Hagar's voice, and the resonation of that voice in that Scottish desert that was there. So you know, there are beautiful images that you can create. I write a lot with images. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment. Um, single authored, 65,000 words, all on my own. Um, I've got a, a process of writing um, in which I write in a very particular way. I write in short bursts of 25 minutes because I usually chicken out, you know, procrastination, right? Oh, I need to write that piece, but suddenly the kitchen is very, very dirty and it's cleaning. <laughs> um, so I write following this technique called Pomodoro technique, which is um, you have to do something for 25 minutes constantly. And 25 minutes is very psychological because um, it's only 25 minutes. Anybody can do anything for 25 minutes. It, it's not daunting. So I always think, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for 25 minutes. And then before I know it, it takes, you know, it, I, I have finished whatever task I have to do. I only write 650 words a day, no more than that. Um, because one of the things I learned as a writer is the idea of sustainability. It's about, writing is about sustaining the practice. So in a sense, it's more like running a marathon. You have to be able to have sufficient stamina to write 65,000 words. So it's not about one day writing 10,000 saying, oh, today was a good day. It's about being constant and writing every day a little bit. Um, I was really pleased when I came here to see Denise Mina that she said don't write more than two, three hours a day. <coughs> it is totally true. That's something I found with the book. I can never write more than that amount. And uh, this is the cover of my book. Um, I write about, the book is mainly about the experience of seeing this work, which is in Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it's, uh, it's a very complicated because a lot of people miss it, 
and because it can only be seen one to one, a little bit like my performance, only one person can sit opposite me and I can only tell the story to that person one on one. And sometimes I feel that writing is a bit like this. Like I was telling you with my mom and her films, it's, uh, it's very much, it's, it's an experiential process between the book and yourself. So I'm really interested in replicating this idea of seeing this work in the writing. And this is a work in Philadelphia where you go into a room and you see a door on the wall. But the door has no handle, so it's not a door that you open and you go into another room. The door has two little holes by which you peep on the other side. So this is a work that is very difficult to photograph because you cannot photograph the door and what's behind at the same time. So it's really difficult to speak about because it's an experience. And everybody that has seen this work cannot say into words what it's like. The only thing they can tell you is go and see it. You know? You've seen pieces like this. Maybe you have gone to the theater or you've been to a concert and have seen a beautiful performance and you're so lost for words that you just, like, you just have got to listen to this singer or you have to see this play. This is a little bit like this. And I'm, I'm finding it really difficult. This is why it's only 650 words, because I find it really difficult to find words for this experience. Um, my experience was very unique, and I will tell you before the break a little bit, so you have a little bit of a laugh about it. Um, so I went all the way to Philadelphia to see this piece. And I really wanted to, because I wanted to write about it. And, you know, it's a long trip, Philadelphia is a long way away. And I went in there and I took my time around the museum because I was anticipating seeing this work, which you can only see that it can never be moved anywhere else. So you have to go all the way there. So I had waited a lifetime to see this piece. And I went in there and saw there people experiencing the piece, coming out, giggling, some people missing it, some people really outraged at what they saw. And I go there to try to see this door, and I go and touch the door finally. The door came from Spain. I knew a lot of things about this piece. The door came from Spain. It's a piece by an artist called Marcel Duchamp, and it was done in 1969, just the last piece before he died. He did it in secret. It took 20 years to do this work. So, you know, I, I knew all of these things, and I was very excited about it. So I go to the door and say, right, I'm going to look. Walk to the door and find out that the holes are here. <laughs> so I do. So I went into the other room and talked to a gallery attendant, and she told me I couldn't move the bench I was sitting in, even though it was perfectly, you know, I could move the bench a little bit, hop on it and see it. I would take my digital camera, they told me, just take a picture, because they allowed me to just tell me, just take a picture. Do you travel all the way to Philadelphia to see something through your camera? Silly, isn't it? I ask a stranger, because I went on my own to Philadelphia, I ask a stranger to lift me up, but I, I ask a few of them and they would, they would not <laughs> lift me up. <laughs> it's like, no, no, why are you asking? You know. So in the end, I found a solution. And I was wearing a little bit of a heel, a bit more than what you have, a heel about this. And I worked out that if I put two shoes on one leg, so I take one shoe off, put it like this, on the other one, and stand, I would be able to reach. So there I was in a museum with two shoes on one leg, and I managed to see. So when um, somebody offered me to write this book, I went back to Philadelphia in September and took a picture. I went this second time round, it was probably even more hilarious. I went with a bag full of shoes to see which shoes would photograph better for the cover of the book. So there I was in the room, it's, it's, it's tiny, the room is about this, right? And there I was, full of shoes everywhere, to try an hour while my husband was photographing. And in the end, this was the best. So like completely in my points, and that's, that's the one that's gonna be the book cover. Yeah. So that's, that experience is the one I'm writing about, about how I couldn't reach those holes to see behind them. Um, I brought you the picture of what you can see behind. Uh, it's a sculpture of a body laying down holding a candle with a landscape at the back. And you can never see... No, I think I can't see the body. You can see the landscape at the back. The body's here. 
One leg, another leg, and the other. You see? It's weird. Yeah? You see it when you point it out. It's weird. It's very weird. I said the body. I didn't say a man or a woman, because no... I mean, it's, it's got characteristics a bit of both. And it's a, it's a sculpture with photographs, with objects. The twigs in which she's laying are real. But the landscape is a photograph. The body is a sculpture, and this is a brick wall. And no matter what you try to do, because you're looking through holes, I did try all this to see if I could see a little bit more. You can never see. It's all hidden behind. And it's a, it's a really beautiful experience to see it. Because you cannot share it with anybody. It's you and your own mm -hmm. watching this. And the room is very dark. Behind the wall, behind the door, is very bright. So the first thing you get is a flash of light. And you have to adjust your eyes. And that process is, is part of seeing this work. This, this adjusting to the work, inside and outside. And it's a really beautiful piece. If you're ever in Philadelphia for whatever reason, <laughs> so, okay. it's cool. <laughs> is it okay to stop here? I think it's time to say the magic words. The buffet is now open. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back about half past. Thank you very much. It's asked every six. Well, welcome back everybody after the, our feet. Are we all suitably full and rounded? <laughs> we've still got a wee dribble of food left, so if you don't eat it, we have to feed it to the librarians downstairs. So feel free to eat away. If you're interested about coming to the writing group, we come uh, to this room every Friday morning from 10 to 12. And even if you're not a, an avid writer, if you've just dabbled or you're interested, still come along and we'll give you a warm welcome. Not quite hot goods, but we'll give you tea and biscuits, <laughs> at least. So this second half, we're going to have a question and answer section. So if anybody's got any questions they want to ask Laura, whether it's about her work, performance, or writing, anything at all, just kind of shout out, and we'll kind of play it from there. Sure. Isabel, do you have a? Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, what I'd like to know is, I have never. Is this? You know this um, door that, that that you had gone to look through in Philadelphia. The uh, artist who did that is he well known in Spain? Is he well known in Spain? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, he will. But depends on who you talk to. Uh. My mom never heard of him until I went to university to study fine art and he was shown to me on my first ever day. Um, you might know him a bit better because he's famous for having put a urinary in an art in an art gallery. I've heard of that. Right? Uh -huh. He's yes. the same artist. Uh -huh. He's the same artist. Uh -huh. he, he famously said that any object, anything, can be a work of art if the artist says so. So that's why he put the urinary, signed it with a different name, put it in the gallery and said, look at this piece of artwork. <laughs> so it's the same artist. The same artist. He did very, very different works. Uh, okay, and, 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 no, and he turned it around. So it didn't look like him. It's really strange how it looked. it looked. The object was made odd. He, almost, he, he made a lot of these things, and he made a, a bottle rack, a, a, a metal thing to dry bottles. Um, he also put a shovel for snow in a gallery called the Art Hinge. So that's, that's, my, that's my work. Um, when he was doing this piece of the door, um, he famously, in 1949, abandoned making artwork. He, he said, I'm not going to make any artwork, I'm done with it, now I want to play chess. And he became a chess grandmaster for 20 years until he died in 1969. Nobody knew he was making this piece. Mm. 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 I think that you would make a success of forever. Mm. 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 Mm.
what you can visualise in the future going to look through the door. What do you mean? Well, none of us know what is ahead of us. Do you think this is why he's saying this is a door and it's closed and you look through the window and you have to imagine what lies ahead for you? Yeah, that's a nice interpretation. I, li I like that. If you see the pins, you might get that impression. The one I got was around, don't trust what you see. Just be marveled by it. Because when you look through the holes, it's really difficult to understand what you're seeing. Because some things are objects, some things are photographs. The waterfall, in here, there is a waterfall here. And the waterfall is a biscuit tin with holes in it and a motor that rotates with a light inside. So the waterfall appears that has water falling. So I think the piece is, there is a lot about that in it. But of course the future is also an illusion because you don't know until you get there, right? Look yesterday and today with the general election and you know, spend all day people saying wishes and what they hope for and then today we have the reality the problem. Problem. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you know, you don't know the future until you get there. So that might be is a nice interpretation no. to think about. You can also never reach it. No. Because no. the door you can never open and go inside the space. Unless you destroy the installation. So if you were to open the door, I think this work would be destroyed. Okay. Yeah. Seem to me. Like the, the whole purpose is yeah. Yeah. that there is an inside and outside yeah. and opening that is like did it meet your expectations or? Oh, it was yeah. amazing. Was much it? more. Much more than you thought. Than I thought. Because, because there was a challenge. And I often think in art, seeing art is not a passive thing. It's not like, oh yeah, painting. And, and you go away. You know, you should start a conversation with a work of art. Saying, okay, what are you about? Mm -hmm. You know, it's as complex as a person. You, know, you want to spend some time with a person, get to know them. And this piece was a bit like that. I had to do a lot of hard work to even see it, <laughs> let alone to understand yeah. it. You know. and, and this is a guy that took 20 years to make this work. It's a long time. It's, it's as long as Joyce took to write Ulysses. He took 17 years to write Ulysses. You know. I would hope that I would give it a bit of time. For somebody who took 20 years to make something, Know, how much of my time is this piece worth? And it actually has been quite a lot because I've written about it, I've performed works about it, I've been twice to see it. I go to see it every time they reproduce it because they don't take it from Philadelphia anywhere because it would destroy the piece. Although he left a beautiful manual. I've got a manual at home, I've got a facsimile of his manual on how to build this piece. And it's, it's amazing, like the manual is amazing because I know exactly it was behind. Yeah. I know how this was yeah. built because I've studied it. Yeah. Um, so he left all these instructions, but it has never been dismantled because it was built specifically for this space. And it was unveiled after he died. So he died first, and then... Was that a stipulation then that it had to remain? Yes. yes. And did he actually go to Philadelphia and install it himself? Mm -hmm. He built it for his studio in New York. So he had a, a room in his house where he built it for. But before he died, he was talking to these two patrons of the Philadelphia Museum of Art who had this really big collection of his works and sold it to them and installed it there. Uh, this is why the fountain, the urinary, it's called Fountain, that piece, um, it is there. It's in Philadelphia. And there is also this work, um, which is, there is a reproduction of this work at Tate Modern in London, but this is the original. And the reason why people know it's the original is a, is a, is a painting which is a sheet of glass, transparent glass painted on it, and, and there are some symbols painted. It's called the large glass. Um, the bride stripped bare by her bachelors. It's a very complex piece, also took a long time. And the reason why this is meant to be the original is because one time they were transporting this piece for an exhibition, many years ago he was alive, and the piece fell and broke, and there are all these bits that are broken in here. You see? And he thought that breaking is what definitely finished this piece. He didn't know whether the piece was finished or not. And when it broke, he said, yes, that's, that's, that's it. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. And Philadelphia has the original. So London is a reproduction. Oh, wow. The London is not broken. 
You know, this idea of it, anything can be art, but obviously he was speaking about, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of thought process behind the art, even the art as an object you put in the gallery. But the kind of modern trend of that is you, you, you just take that part of it and say anything can be art, i.e. lifting something, saying that's art. And he wasn't really meaning that when he said anything can be art, when you could use any kind of materials or any, but you still have to have art in it. And a lot of people forgot about the art thing and just started putting things in galleries and calling it art without any explanation right. about it. Right. There, is, there is a piece of tape modern, which I love, by two German guys, Fischli and Weiss. And it's a very complex piece and it talks about art installation. It's about, it's about the materials you use to put pictures on the wall. Right? It's not about the pictures on the wall, it's about the material, the drill, the pieces <laughs> of wood, all that kind of stuff. So when I went to see it, I think modern. I stood good 20 minutes in front of a fire extinguisher that had nothing to do with a piece, by the way. There in the corner. Oh, that's interesting that they put in here. Of course, it's had nothing to do with it. Somebody had to come and tell me, that is a fire extinguisher. <laughs> I did that to a PG art gallery. I was going to an exhibition of my friend's son, and it was shown. And there was this big metal thing in the middle of the floor. And I'm standing looking at it. I said, and what is that? What's that meant to be? He said, that's the central eating system. <laughs> 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 well, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Should write a piece of art criticism of the central heating system in Paisley. How brilliant! Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. See, you went through your, uh, your career finding inspiration in other insights to like, everyday objects and you know your dance and that sort of thing. Is that something that you've always had within you, or do you think that's something that's developed and grown as you've progressed through your career? I think it's something that is it's a very good question. I think it's something that's within my temper, temperament. I think it's something that I am drawn to that and always have been. It's the same with different places I've lived, different language I had to learn. It's always like, um, I often say this to my mum, I think I, write, I like the position of being the slight outsider in things. So I dance but I'm not a dancer. I paint, but I'm not exactly a painter because I did sculpture, really, to be honest with you, when I was doing painting. It's that position of seeing things with new eyes. And choreographers that work with me, this is why they work with me. Because I don't dance like a dancer, I dance like a sculptor. So, for example, one, one good example of this is we were making a piece based on Carmen, um, a dance piece. And we were developing this piece, we were making it. So there was no choreography, we had to make it. We were at the very early stages. And I was working with many dance graduates, like properly trained dancers in Laban and in Dundee and in Northern School of Art. And anytime the trained dancers created dance, they would have the stage, the public, and they would dance like this in front of the public. And I would be the one saying, but but we don't have to have the public there. We can put them all around and we can dance behind them. And I, I would think spatially about that, whereas the dancers would think about the nature of the movement and the technique of the movement. And I think that's something I always have <coughs> sought. So when I did, uh, for my master's in drawing, when I did sound, I was looking at the drawing qualities in sound. So for me, is uh, this is why I'm multidisciplinary. For me, is all the same thing. I can I can use drawing qualities when I write. I can use writing qualities when I dance. I can create narrative, rhythm. I can think when I dance on making sentences or how movement sounds if I read it. To me, all those things are a bit, the senses are all one thing. Where does your photography come into it? I didn't show you those images. That's a good question. Um, I really love Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and I'm always been fascinated by the um, by the opening um, 
sequence of it. By when she comes out of the taxi, she has to go to Tiffany's to look at these rings. And this is an experience that I always like. I mean, it's, I'm not only about the experience of mad women or seeing artworks or stuff like that. I think one can get experiences that are worth writing about when you walk in the street all the time. Um, I like cities more than countryside. Some people get these experiences from seeing nature. I like cities. So a lot of my pictures are about the experience of me walking around in the cities and objects calling at me. And I, and I take these photographs, I've had a few exhibitions of me um, taking, self, they're self-portraits, way before selfie was a thing. <laughs> way before, I have to say, it was there way before. And they're always reflections in front of shop windows of objects I cannot buy. Because I can't that afford them. Mm -hmm. I can't afford them. And I've got a lot in Argyle Arcade, because I really like it. It's, it's a beautiful experience to walk around there, yeah. and all these glistening diamond rings, yeah. which I feel they're like eyes. <laughs> and if you go out... Oh, of course not. I mean, I've got... I think I put one picture here with a lot of um, prices. Let me see if I can look at this. If you look at the prices in here... Yeah, that's one 8,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 all the problems in my life. If I had one, life would be complete. And what happened? You go one, and of course, then you want to yes. <laughs> right? I have an iPhone 5, I want a 6 now. That kind of thing. So, photography helped me to get the object without buying it. And I don't know if it's the same for you, but there is something of that, isn't it? It's a, it's a cheap escape <laughs> from it. Yeah. Or you can walk around, you can walk, they say that you can walk around a, a shop with the eyes up and by the time you get to the cash, you know, the outplays and you actually don't want it anymore. It's just the idea of holding it, touching it, smelling it, whatever, mm -hmm. and then get to the, the cash desk and you don't want it. Absolutely. So, that's where all the excitement is, it's the anticipation of the market, mm -hmm. and once you've had yeah. But from a writer's point of view, look how sensuous that experience is, how much there is in the idea. We were talking about M&S earlier. The idea of somebody walking with a 60 pound cashmere jumper around m and I mean, there's stuff you can write about. It is, And one of the things where my photography came in is I always photograph with the body. And I write with the body. I write about things I feel that are close to my skin, because it's the only way I have of writing. I tend not to write with my brain, because if I write with my brain, I write very long, complicated words that nobody can understand. <laughs> right? So I try to write. I've got this technique as well. There is this um, woman who has written a lot of words about writing. So she, she's, she's called Natalie Goldberg, and she wrote a book called Writing with the Bones. Right? So not only writing writing with your eyes or with your mouth or with your ears. Some, some of us hear writing, some of us have got to talk writing or see writing. Natalie Goldberg has this technique, which I think is very good, that she makes everybody, and this is particularly difficult for me, write with the two feet on the ground. Ground it. Never write like this, because you are up in the head. You're not writing about anything that's connected to anything. You're not connected, so this is, a way I write, and I like writing connected to the object or to whatever it is that I'm writing. And the idea to me of walking around the shop with an object and then not wanting it is, is precisely what I write about. So it's that idea of, yeah. of touching. Yeah. You know, when I look at these beautiful rings, I can go back about 10 years and I was going somewhere very important and I was in my best clothes and in those <coughs> days I could wear high heels and I wanted a present for uh, my nephew's wife's 21st and she likes nice jewellery and I went into the Argyle Arcade and I thought 
every shop, a jeweler shop I went into, they gave me a seat, they gave me a, and I narrowed it down to a ring I was wearing, and they all looked at the ring, and I was didn't tell them that it cost me £26 plus postage from QVC of an imitation diamond. <laughs> and I'll wear it next week. It's a stonker. And I couldn't tell the difference. It looked, and because I was dressed up, and this, and you were, would, you, would Madam like a seat? Oh, did I enjoy it? <laughs> I didn't You're a performer. This is great. <laughs> Piece of performance art. <laughs> 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 would you be tempted to imitate that to get an experience? Oh, I have done that a few times. Have you? Yeah, I have done that a few times. And I also tend to um, go to wedding shops. I'm married. Mm -hmm. Married almost 10 years ago. I still go to wedding shops. <laughs> Take my wedding ring off and just like, can I try that one? <laughs> that one. I think is really wonderful. Of course, that's, uh, sometimes I imitate those things. Um, it's very difficult to, for example, photograph in Argyll Arcade. Yeah. I got taken to, um, you know, taken by the police a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because they think I'm going to steal. I'm taking oh, photos okay. to find the layout yeah. of the shop. Like uh, 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 they don't like it at all. Casing the joint, as they call it. Casing the joint. But legally, I'm, I'm entitled to. I'm part of an association called I'm a Photographer, Not a Terrorist, that looks at these particular people photographing in public spaces and what you're allowed and not allowed to do. Especially with law around children and parks and public and private property, um, which I think is, is really interesting. I would not be able to photograph. Uh, myself with a nice dress and a false diamond ring inside the shop, for example, or even in MS. Although I've done little videos in MS with various different things. Because I, I went into a shop and they had, I think, what was it? I can't remember. I think it was from Murabi, that house of Brewer. And I think oh, there was a lot of hats. So it was one shop I was in a lot of hats, and it said, hey, You're not allowed to photograph your friends wearing these hats, you have to buy them first. <laughs> I, when I bought my dress for my 50th uh -huh. birthday, they would only let me take a photograph of the dress oh, once I bought it. Amazing. They wouldn't let me try on. Uh -huh. Some people would copy them. Some people would copy them. Run it up. Run it up. Uh -huh. uh, my mother used to do that. <laughs> my mother could make her own dress, make it part of it. She was an embroidery designer. <laughs> And we'd no money when I was growing up, and I said to her, the shop along there has got it was Cliff Richards and Summer Holiday, and they'd all these copies of the dresses, and we went along, and my mother did, and a few days later I was sashing <coughs> along because she could copy the dresses. I have to <laughs> say, probably would have been. I'm not a knitter. I'm, I'm a sewer, and I can I can also right copy dresses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, just I remember I did a, it was a top and a jacket, lace, and it was trimmed with satin, and it was what George Collins wore in Dynasty. She had on this thing, and I was really, so I went away and made it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's not the photographing, you actually managed to just get it. A long time. I wish I could make diamond rings, but... Uh, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form oh, of art. Uh, 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 so we're being sincere. <laughs> and I remember mean, my sister, you know, years ago, we had two sisters that done the same thing. But one in particular, she would go out on Saturday morning to the Paris, you know, kind of the market, yeah. and she'd come back with her wad of cloth under her tube, yeah. and she'd be wearing it the same night. Yeah. And we yeah. sat yeah. in front of her dress. My mother did that. Was her house was, was mobbed out, you know, there wasn't an empty drawer in the place, there was all these dresses, you know. <laughs> Talking about the barras, this is the best place to get any imitation and fake handbags oh, and anyway. Oh, I, yeah. I have a few Vivian Westwoods at home from <laughs> <laughs> which I quite like. I actually prefer shopping there because you also get a story about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I go to Vivian Westwood shop and look at them, but mm. I don't buy them. I'm not no. going to pay £3,000 for a handbag. No. I mean, I'm crazy. So the first time I took 
an image like this. The first time I thought that photography might be a good way of doing this, I was in New York and um, I was working there, but a very big snowfall, I mean all my stories are about shoes, right? So there was a big snowfall and I didn't have any footwear that was suitable to walk. I tried walking in the streets, it was in New York for the first time. I mean, how can you be there for a week and not walk anywhere, not go out of your hotel? It was really sad. So I looked in the yellow pages to see what I could do and I found out that there were two things very nearby where I was staying. The first thing was the Museum of Modern Art. Great, right? I could see Picasso paintings and really amazing. But that's not what I chose. The Manolo Blahnik shop was there <laughs> as well. <laughs> so I went to the Manolo Blahnik shop, which maybe you would have been able to get in, but it was only by appointment. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Only by appointment. So I was so frustrated, I was only by appointment, and of course they were not going to give me an appointment, no chance. Um, that I took this picture of the shoe that was in the shop window, there was only one shoe, and Manolo Blanik is really interesting because, you know, we have two feet, uh, but they only put one shoe, yeah. <laughs> which always surprises me, like, what's the other one, you know, <laughs> Just, it feels like, like this, it feels like, a, like elevated, like a work of art, like this is a unique piece, there is yeah. no, there's no two, there's only yeah. one, and it was a beautiful shoe that Britney Spears had used in one of her music videos, and it was, Swarovski crystals on the hill um, and leather, it was amazing. Six thousand dollars. I'm hoping it was for the pair. I'm hoping it was for the pair. Can you imagine if it was only for one? Well, you talk about that. I remember I was in along the road at the Baton Road and they were renovating this shop and there was a workman's boot in the window. And, and the label on it says, buy one, get one. <laughs> 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 and I thought, well, somebody does send to you. Yes. 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 Yes.